All right. Oh, thank you. Thank you, guys, for, for standing and, and clapping. Very good. Now, um, it's, uh, it's fantastic to be here, of course. I just want to speak to you down here. Can everyone see me? Actually, I'm pretty short. Maybe I should go back up. I'll go back up, sorry. <laughs> I went down to Hobbiton. I visited Hobbiton a little while ago. And I, I, I fitted in the doors. Jeez. Anyway, happy days. Oh, it's, it really is good to be here and, um, and, and to be part of... It's all right, I'm a tradie. I can fix stuff. I don't need it. Oh, thank you, yeah, sister. Yeah. I'm not that short, though. Hold on. I've got to pray to you this morning. Oh, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you this morning for uh, everyone here. And I just pray that you help them all this morning. And uh, help us all to get to know you better and to, and to find out what your will is for our lives. And um, Lord, we just thank you that, you, <laughs> that you've got a great plan for us and that you want to uh, connect with us on a, on a greater level this morning. So we bless you and thank you. And uh, I just want to say, everyone, um, thank you so much for coming up. You guys have traveled from, a lot of you have traveled from all over the show. You know, from, um, from two hours away at, um, at Ruakaka, Breen Bay, down, you know, seven and a half hours down to... Uh, to live in, you know, and, and thank you so much for coming out. I know God's going to really bless you guys for the effort that you've put in. Thank you so much for giving last night, and to, you know, you, you've got a generous spirit. Thanks, mate. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and you know, I, I know that um, God really does pay that back. And and what I'm believing for uh, this morning is for you to uh, connect with the Holy Spirit on a on, a, on another level again. And uh, I'm going to be praying for some people, but later on. I believe God wants to break us free from some of the stuff that's been holding us back from our true identity. And so this morning, I want to um, share with you, uh, while you're all here, while the leaders and the youth are here, I want to share with you a really, really funny story uh, in the Bible that actually, it's kind of really funny, but it's kind of really freaky. And it's one of those ones where it makes you stop and go, what just happened there? And uh, when you do that, sometimes it's good because it makes you go back and look right into it and, and see what the carry-on was. So uh, I want to I read this morning from the book of Acts. I love the book of Acts because a lot of it talked about the, the stories of Paul the Apostle. And uh, I love Paul the Apostle because he was an adventurer. He, he went on expeditions. He went on missions. He was out there doing the biz, if you know what I mean. And um, one thing I can't stand is people who talk a lot but don't do anything. So my speech this morning, like Paul said in the Bible, is I don't really have real eloquent speech, but I like to come with a demonstration of the power of God. I'm not really interested in talking too much, right? but I do like to come and just and, and bring in the power of the Holy Spirit something to change you. And I know a lot of you this morning are going to have a change in your life. There's going to be a change of direction. Uh, some of it may feel fluffy to you. Some of it may get a whack. Whatever. doesn't matter. But it will change your life. You see, I've only heard it twice this weekend, and I'm the one who said it. But the name of this weekend is actually called Uprising. I want to tell you something about an uprising. All right? An uprising is not something you watch on TV. An uprising is not a, a message you get on Instagram or wherever from somebody else. An uprising is not something nice and fluffy you read in the newspaper about and they think, oh, that's nice. An uprising, an uprising involves violence, overthrowing, and power. So why are us Christians talking about uprising then? Aren't we supposed to be nice tiddly dinks playing tiddly winks for flipping on a Friday night at youth? No, we're not. As much as all the people around you think you're just square and, oh, yeah, well, those Christians, yeah, boring, you know, come out with us. This is not what it's about. Our mission is actually greater. We're part of an incredible revolution and uprising that is taking over the world and has taken over for the last 2,000 years. And, you know, there's been a bit of an up and a bit of a down and a bit of an up, but in general, the body of Jesus Christ or the kingdom of God or Christians around the world is increasing at an incredible rate, especially in countries not like New Zealand and not like Australia and not like Europe and not like America, which have traditionally been really sort of Christian-y nations. You want to see what's happening in Asia, in Africa, and Latin America. I used to work for a mission organization and we used to go into those places. We used to go to a lot of places that were really dangerous. And I saw where the uprising was happening. People who were being killed for their faith, people who were being tortured for their faith, people who were being excommunicated out of their communities for their faith, for believing in Jesus, and yet they were having incredible impact on the world around them and their generation. 
In Africa at the moment, we're at about 25,000 people becoming Christians every day. Oh, didn't you know that? Didn't they send you that message on Instagram? In China, right, during the years where you weren't allowed to be a Christian, the amount of Christians grew from 1 million people to 120 million people, all in the underground churches. I used to go visit them. I used to go smuggle Bibles into China. You see, uprising is about action. It's about being part of something that's greater than us and playing our part in it and taking action. Uprising requires a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Generally, an uprising is people die. Jesus died. He was at the start of the uprising. What hope is there for us? <laughs> Sorry, that was a joke. I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> oh, there's plenty of hope for us. No, that's right. But it's true. If you, if you want to be part of the uprising and if you want to take your place, and if your place is generally going to be somewhere where you're a leader or an influencer, I'm talking about a proper influencer, not one of these dudes on Facebook, or Instagram. Oh, my Lord. Is it the more body you show, the more influence you have? Is that how it works? Man, I, man I'll show you my body. There'll be no influence here, mate. Oh, man, look at this. It's all fallen from there, down the back, further down. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Uh, it's got to get worse, I tell you. Is that how shallow we've become? A million or so dozies follow some blimmin' chick who's got everything out on show and holding a Gucci bag? Oh, my Lord. You know, I read a funny story about this, uh, this chick, and she, she was like, oh... You know, to all the people that she influences, oh, oh, I, I, you know, I go everywhere and people recognize me and I went to this hotel and I said to the guy at the hotel, oh, you know, this is Australia, I said to him, oh, I'm such and such the influencer, I've got, you know, one million followers and da-da-da-da, you know, how about you give me a free night's accommodation and, and you know, and I'll put your hotel on, on my influencer flip on Instagram, whatever the heck it's called. All right? Old mate goes, doubt it. Hey, you want to stay here? You pay. So she went back and, oh, this big cry session on her Instagram. Oh, I was treated terribly today because, because he wouldn't give me a free night's accommodation. He didn't know who, he didn't recognize me that I had all you followers. Please respond to me and let me know that you still love me. What a pofta. Jeez. <laughs> Oh, is this what we've become? That our identity, right, our identity is mixed up on how many people like our flipping comments or pictures or whatever? Oh, my shallow Lord. Unbelievable. He must be laughing. In fact, he is. Because it's so crazy. In fact, the, the uh, instigators of a lot of the social media these days, uh, Facebook and Instagram, Apple, um, a lot of these guys have recognized they've created an incredibly large social problem where now there's actually a medical term for a person who's addicted to social media. I've never seen so much anxiety, anxiety in the lives of young people as there are today. And a lot of that is based on the feedback they get, who they feel they are. It's crazy times. I want to say to you this morning, from a generation that's probably a little bit older than, than some of you, not all of you, but, but most of you here, I have confidence in you. I have confidence in you to do whatever God wants you to do and to be part of an incredible uprising. I have complete confidence in you because I know all you need to do is this weekend and as you go on in your life, open your heart to God and let him work through your life. He'll change you. Here's this funny story. So I do get distracted a little bit. I'll tell you one more funny story. <laughs> I call it the horse whisperer. So I used to be a cop. I don't know how good I was, but I used to love driving fast cars, fighting and all that sort of stuff. So, um, of course, you can only do that in West Auckland. Um, and one night at 2 o'clock in the morning, it's getting back to identity here, at 2 o'clock in the morning, we're driving around, looking for a bit of trouble, and uh, 
and doing burnouts down the back of Henderson there. But anyway, um, no, no. I, I, I did get, like, raked over the coals for wrecking so many cop cars because, uh, I don't know, that's the Duke's a hazard, you know, like, chips, all that sort of stuff. I just love that. I was from that generation. But anyway, we're 2 o'clock in the morning, we're cruising around, and we get this call that, um, yeah, that there's these, um, these horses loose up it's on, the, on the Western Highway, up, like, up by Westgate up there. And some of you might have drove them down there yesterday. And they were on the Hobsonville Road. There was like three horses. And they were just like, you know, I don't know, cruising around the road. And, you know, this is, uh, someone had rung in and, oh, you better get the cops. You know, get up here because, you know, like we know what to do with horses, of course. So, yeah, oh, that'll be me, mate. We'll go up there. So we go up there. Sure enough, here's these um, horses. Three of them standing in the middle of the road. There's a car on the other side of them, so they don't want to go that way. So we turn up, and uh, it's about, I don't know, two kilometres down the road to the main, like, northwestern motorway. And we don't want the horses going on the motorway because that could cause a lot of trouble. You imagine driving down the road and three horses come running across the motorway. So anyway, so my partner, a good young fella, he says to me, well, I know what to do. I know what to do. I've, I've done sort of this sort of stuff before, so I know what to do. So I said, yeah, okay, all right, well, I'll, um, I'll wait here, you know, in the car, see what happens. So he gets out, and he, like, walks up to the horses. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. I'm looking at him going, what are you doing, man? And he goes, no, nah, I know how to calm them down. I said, oh, yeah, okay. So, oh, oh, they haven't got like they haven't got all the straps on to hold. It's just three horses, big horses. So they go, whoa, 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 and then they so they walk towards him, and then he, you know the horse whisperer starts freaking out, and he's like, whoa, 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 like that. Anyway, so that, that makes the horses more, you know, sort of frightened. So they must have said to each other. Whoa, like that, and because they just up, they reared up and bolted straight towards him. So he's run back towards the car. I'm in the car, and and I'm like, oh no, here we go. What's going to happen? They're going to run down to the motorway. So anyway, <laughs> he jumps in. I say, what the heck are you doing, man? You're a flipping horse whisperer. He goes in there. The horses run straight past our car down to the motorway. I say, right, leave this to me. I know what to do. So I turn the cop car around. I put the lights on and the sirens on full. And I thought, I'm just going to round them up like they do in the movies. You know what I mean? <laughs> so this was never reported, by the way. So anyway, I'm going down, going down the road. I got my lights and siren on. This is like freaking the horses out. It was actually quite bad. It's like animal cruelty. But I was like, and I thought, oh, I know what to do. So I, I wound the window down. I come driving up next to them. They're just bolting. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, come on, come on, let's go. Because that's what they do in the cowboy movies. You know, they get the thing and that. Anyway, um, one may or may not have fell over. But anyway, he got up again and he was, he was running down the road. And then uh, we were getting closer and closer to the highway. And I thought to myself, I'm going to have to cut them off. And it was really weird. As I came up, these things would have been freaking out. I mean, it's a terrible story, but I, yeah, I didn't really know what else to do. But they come down, and I just was like, Choo-hoo! Because it's like, a, you know, the, the, the Pacific Islanders. That's that noise, eh, mate? I was like, this has got to work. Anyway, the horses just, they just turned and went up a driveway, and a gate was open, and they went into the paddock. There was a paddock there. I was like, I got out, closed the gate. <clears throat> That's how it works, mate. That's how it works. None of this horse whisper rubbish, mate. You've got you to gotta round them up, mate, if you're going to do something. That was really funny. Anyway, listen, getting back to the message. It's a really funny story. It all comes down to who you are. Here we go here. We're looking at the book of Acts, chapter 19 and verse 11. Probably come up on the screen. Acts, chapter 19 and verse 11. Really, really funny story, but real powerful for you this morning said this, that uh, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul the Apostle so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick. So imagine you take your hanky down or you know, uh, a tissue or whatever, taken down to the sick, their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. How cool would that be today? If, imagine if you're at school or, or uni or wherever, someone turned up with a handkerchief and just came over and put it on somebody else and they had a massive manifestation of demons coming out of them. Or they suddenly, they got healed of something, some disease or something. It would be awesome. It's fantastic. Paul was moving in incredible power at the time. It was an amazing time. 
God did extraordinary miracles through him, and it was fantastic. 13, some Jews, all right, check this out, some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, this is what these Jews would do, they would say, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, I command you to come out. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who were doing this. So Sceva was, was one of the chief priests. They all had a turn, being the chief guy for that year. And uh, his, he had seven sons. He'd done pretty well. Anyway, so he had seven sons that were going around trying to be the big exorcists. Going around trying to be the demon busters. Trying to be the ghost busters. It says this, one day, check this out, this is where the spirit realm opens. One day, the evil spirit answered them. So they were going around and they were trying all their religious tricks. They were going around and swinging the big thing with a bit of smoke in it. Maybe they had a bit of garlic tied around there, you know. Like, oh, bro, bring your garlic tie today because I think we need a garlic tie because that's probably going to work today. They were doing all this stuff. They were walking around and they'd, they'd have, like, you know, Team Skeever on the back where the exorcists will exercise you today and exercise you tomorrow. They were the guys everybody knew were going around and they were like, they were like you know, that's the chiefs, that's the chief priest's sons. They're going around. But on this particular day, it said, the evil spirit answered them. I don't know if you've ever had an evil spirit answer you. But that was quite a freaky occurrence. Here we are, the seven brothers. There was probably one older brother that led them through it all. But the seven brothers were there. And they're like, they're saying this. <clears throat> well, let's go into this house. This person's got an evil spirit. They've contacted us for an appointment. We're going to come in and we're going to deliver them of the evil spirit. We're going to get rid of this evil spirit. So they went in. They got the person. And they said, right, get the smoke going. Bro, get your hands this way, that way. You know, you say that chant that you used to do. Right. In the name of Jesus, that Paul preaches, come out of him. And the Spirit answers them back and goes, nah, Jesus I know. And I've heard about Paul, but who are you? Ooh, can you imagine that? Imagine the evil spirit inside of the possessed, possessee. And let's just demystify it for a second. You've got this evil spirit that's inside of the person. He's just cruising in there, destroying their life. You know, I've had a bit of crap into your life here. You know, like... Apostle Patty was talking about last night, the dry places. Oh, yeah, I'll just wreck your marriage here. Yeah. You know, there was, a, there, was a, there was a spirit in there, pretty unclean. I'll defile you a bit here. You know, my whole aim for you is to take you out in life. Hopefully the best thing I can do is get you to commit suicide because um, then, you know, you, you, I can go to someone else then. So old mate's sitting inside of him, just waiting. And then these seven blokes turn up. Here's the oldest, he comes in, there's the flipping smoke swinger, there's the garlic holder, and there's old mate that chucks his hands around in a different sort of a way. I don't know. One of them names has got to be Barry, but anyway. <laughs> Not the Barry I know. So Barry, what's Barry doing? He's, try, he's earnestly sort of freaking out going, holy dang, this thing just spoke back. So the... <laughs> Look, Jesus I know, I know about Paul, but who are you? And it says this, <laughs> he said, who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit, you probably watch this sort of stuff on some movies, you've probably seen this sort of stuff happen, jumped on them and overpowered them. So this one dude who had this evil spirit suddenly had supernatural power, jumped on seven of them, Right? Jumped on seven of them. And he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. 
So here they come in in their lovely robes with all their garb, all their religious stuff. Here they come in with all their religious stuff. They come in to perform this act on this poor person, this poor lowly person who's afflicted by a spirit. They come in there. So I would imagine being the crowd outside. Ooh, there they go. They're going in. It's Team Skeever. Man, don't mess with these guys. They're going in. There's Barry. There's old mate. There's, there they are. They're going in. They're going into the house. So you imagine a crowd, you know, probably they're like their, their, their um, followers. It'll be like, you know, it'll be like their, their um, was it the band? The band have them and they, they follow them around? Oh, groupies. I got the, I got the Skeever hoodie as well. We're the groupies. We're watching Team Skeever go in to exercise the demon. So, you can hear a little bit of shouting going on there. You know, bang! Ah, Jeez, I'm doing a good job today. Here they go. Ooh, can't wait to see what happens. You know, da, da, da. so you've got the crowd, the, the media are probably there. Someone's there because it's been written in the Bible. All right, so everybody's there waiting. You know, and they're screaming and banging and crashing and they're wrecking the whole place. And it's like, this is like the most dramatic, awesome one. You know, this is going to be good. This is going to be, they're going to be legends after this. Next minute, the door is broken down. And out come, running, seven naked men. Can you imagine? In every movie, there's the photographer. Chuck that on your influencer page, mate. See what happens. <laughs> Seven naked, bleeding men come running out of a house after performing their religious duty. How crazy is that? How crazy is that? And the key of this message and the key of this verse, and this is for something for you to, say, uh, to, to hear this morning, is that they were going there to do a bit of action but they were going in from a religious basis, a religious basis with all the tricks, all the tradition, all the ritual to go in and do something that was outside their realm. And yeah, it may have worked a few times where, you know, where some of the demons might have gone, oh yeah, let's have given a bit of a show, but whatever. But on this particular day, they got put on the spot and they got shown up and the question was asked, who are you? Friends, young people, this morning I want to ask you a question. And I'm not a demon, that's okay. I want to ask you this question. Who are you? Who are you? It's one of the hardest questions for any of us to answer. Who are you? Who are you? If you want to be part of a generation that has an uprising, a part of the kingdom of God, then this day is going to come for you. You're going to be part of this thing, having a great time. Yeah, I'm part of the youth group and all this stuff. Having a great breakthrough, God's moving, it's awesome. And then one day there's going to come a time where the question's going to be asked, who are you? The demon said, I know Jesus. The demon definitely knew Jesus. Jesus was the creator. Jesus would just have smashed them on the spot. They knew Jesus. They know in that realm who Jesus is. The demon said, yeah, I know about Paul. Because Paul had been going around in the name of Jesus doing all sorts of carry-on. All right? But he didn't know who these blokes were. These guys were doing like a, a, what's what called a third party exorcism. I cast you out in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. There is no third party deliverance. You either deliver or you don't deliver. You either have something or you don't have something. The evil spirit knew who Paul was. Paul had been doing miracles, deliverance, everything. He was walking in the same spirit that what Patty was saying last, Apostle was Patty was saying, the closeness of God. Jesus, when all the Pharisees came around him to speak to him, they were arguing with him all the time. And the, the main thing they said to him a lot of the time was, well, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? I'm challenging you this morning, young people. Who do you think you are? I'm not having a go. I'm just challenging. Who do you think you are? Jesus said, I know who I am. Jesus said this, three keys for you this morning. He said, I know where I come from, and I know where I'm going. Young person, whatever you do, find out where you come from. Be truthful to that. I could take you right back to about six generations ago. You get to a certain age in life, you think, oh, I better find out where I came from. You can do that right now. I know, my, my dad's name was um, Te Aho Wanakori Hirangi. 
from a Tainui tribe. My papa goes back to uh, King Te Whetawhiro, uh, what was his name, Portato, the first married king. So I'm a direct descendant down there. So my family has a position within, somewhere within the Kingitanga of the, of the Maori, you know, married him and that sort of stuff, in the Tainui. All right, so I sort of know where I come from on that side. On my mum's side, I know where I come from. All right, I know where I come from. I know that their, their family came from England. Uh, my, my, you know, 10 granddads back owned a brewery. I like beer. No, I don't. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> hey, I'm living in Aussie. It's real hot. Hey, um, yeah, you, know, you know what I mean? My grandfather owned a brewery. They, they, they loved the brewery. And in fact, on my dad's side, um, one of the other grandfathers, he had a brewery as well. So I don't know. It just sort of came down. So but you saw alcohol come down as well and, and all the issues uh, related to that which is, is good that that's been broken. So I, I, know, I know where I come from naturally. I know where I come from in my life. I know who my father was. I know what my father was like. You know, I know, I know my journey. And, and friends, sometimes it's really good to be open about your journey. O be open about it. Don't be, don't be shy of it, okay? You've got to know where you come from. Sometimes people look at you, young person, they go, oh, you're from the wrong side of the tracks. Oh, you're from Levin. You're from Cairo. Oh, yeah, I know you. You're from West Auckland. <laughs> oh, are you from, you from Rotorua? <whistles> are you from Toke Town? Tokaroa? Are you from there? Ooh. Ooh. Are you from Kauro? Hmm. You know? Yeah, I am from Blimmin' Kauro. That's where I come from. Hey, be open about it. You know where you come from. Jesus said, I know where I come from, and I know where I'm going. Yeah, I'm from Kauro, I'm from up in the Gold Coast, I'm from wherever you want me to come from. I know that where I've come from. But I also know I first came from heaven down here, and God has a great purpose for my life. And I'm going back to heaven at the end of my life. Don't ever be shy about that. Jesus said, I know where I come from, and I know where I'm going. There's something to stick in there. Next time a demon asks you who you are, you say, oh, well, I know where I come from. I know exactly where, and I'll fess it up. Yeah, I come from a life of drugs and alcohol. That's where I come from. I come from a, uh, you, know, I did, uh, you know, I was into Satanism. That's where I come from. I come from abuse. I come from this. I come from that. I come from all this sort of stuff. Yeah, I come from there, but I know where I'm going. Because at the start, I came from God, and I'm going back to God. And I'm going to fulfill my purpose while I'm on my way. It's the first thing Jesus said to the religious leaders. Here's the second thing he said. I am with the Father, and the Father is with me. You've got to know who your father is. One of the great things about knowing who you are, you've got to know whose you are. And some of you think of the father, and you've got some shady ideas who the father is. Some of you, and I want to speak to you this morning, straight into your heart. Some of you, you don't want to think about your father because it's too painful. Some of you don't want to think about dad because there's a whole lot of issues there that you don't want to deal with. But hey, open up this morning. God wants to come and heal you of that. He wants to come and fix some of that stuff. You need to know this. Even though you come from your dad down here, right? I had a dad, uh, he was a hard man. He got brought up on the Mariah and he was really hard. And there was no love, nothing like that, right? So you've got to whack around the ears if you, if you were doing something silly. You've got to whack around the ears if you cried from that whack around the ears. And you keep getting a whack around the ears until you stop crying. And then you get out and work. So that's where he came from. So I had a dad who never, he never once said the word, I love you. Never once. Except the day he died and one day he was so drunk, I don't think he knew what he was saying. I love my dad. I honor him. I respect him. But he never did that. And I've come to realize that your dad never did it. He couldn't do it. He, he was almost like emotionally paralyzed. He couldn't show that sort of loving emotion because he was brought up hard as. All right? So I determined in my life that, yeah, I'm going to change. But I'm, I'm telling you now, that's my natural dad. He did his best. I can never hold him. I can't be angry at him and all that sort of stuff. Some of you, you got natural dads and they abuse you. They sexually abuse you. They flip him well, you know, punched on with you. They verbally abuse you. You know, some of that stuff happened. That, that was then. You know, and if you're in that place right now, I'm telling you, as an ex-cop, you need to get into a safe place. There's no doubt about that. But some of you, that's in the past. Guys, let God deal with that. Let God deal with that. All right? I want to tell you right now, your father is your father in heaven. He is your father. Don't worry about your father here on earth. He's just like you. He made mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. 
You're probably gonna you're probably gonna say stuff into your own kids' lives that are gonna balls up their life. We're all the same. But we are with the Father, and the Father is with us. Here's another key for you. If you want to know who you are, you've got to know whose you are. Is he your father? If he's your father, no demon can ask you who you are and not get a response from you. Yeah, I know where I come from. I also know whose I am. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Whose I am. Whose I am. The last thing is this. And this is a real key for you. To know who you are. So you know where you're from, you know whose you are. Is to know that God loves you right now. And he loves you right now, like Pastor Emma said, in whatever situation you're in right now. Whether you, right, get this, whether you feel like you're close to God or far away from God, he loves you exactly the same. And you come under his wings. You come under his authority. It's a real interesting thing. When you're under authority, you can do a lot of stuff. We all think, ah, stuff that, throw off the blooming chains, man, I want to be my own man. That sort of works good for a while until reality hits you. When you're under authority, when you are under somebody, someone else in your life, maybe a pastor or a leader or someone who's a father for you, when you're under those people, you come under their covering and you have authority to do stuff. So, for instance, put it this way. Uh, but, you know, I do public speaking that a lot, and, uh, you know, I'm in front of crowds. I can do all that sort of stuff. I'm happy to speak to people. But in my family, I'm not the oldest brother, but I'm the spokesman. So that means that, you know, like at my own father's funeral, I took the funeral. At his unveiling a couple of weeks ago, I took the unveiling. Whenever there's any sort of family deal to do with, or on the Mariah River, although I can't speak Maori, but wherever we are, I, I, I've got to be the guy who speaks. And uh, the funny thing is this, you think, oh, yeah, well, you're the man, you know, you're the, you're the guy who does it. I can't say anything unless my older brother gives me the nod because I understand where I am in the pecking order. Though I might, be, I, might, I might lead a massive church, I might have a massive business. In different areas of our life, we need to know where we are. So my older brother, he doesn't even go to church. And he loves going fishing. He goes down, he goes gets your mile and all this. He, he, he runs two or 300 people at work. You know, he, he's, he's a, a man in his own right. But he's the oldest in our family. So whenever I go to somewhere, I come under his authority. It's weird. People are like, oh, you should be doing it. Nah, man. I don't even talk, right? I won't even start a service unless I look over and he goes like that. You know what it's like? And when you're under that, you're under covering and you have authority to do stuff. I can't say anything here or even pray for you one second unless uh, Pastor Brent or Pastor Ryan or Emma let me. I can't just go wild here because I'm under their authority. You ought to know who you are. If someone asks you who you are, you can instantly recognize, oh, I'm under the authority of my pastor, my parents, whoever it is. Okay? It's an incredible key. I just want to encourage you this morning because I know for many of you, this is kind of a new concept. It's like, uh, you know, I didn't really plan on confronting demons in the next couple of weeks. If you're part of God's kingdom, sometime in your life, you will confront demons. Because there's a whole spirit realm out there that is attacking people's lives and has held many of us under for so long. And we're part of the team. We're part of the J team, for a cheesy sort of a phrase. We're part of the team to go and do the biz. So if we're part of the team, we need to know who we are, who we are in Christ. Young people, if we can just get this into your heart, right? When you go somewhere and you have the opportunity to help somebody else in whatever it is you're doing, the, the opportunity might come up for you to pray for them. And in that time where you can pray for somebody else, because this isn't just about you the whole time. It's not just about you getting stuff. It's about equipping you to go and do stuff. Because that would be real boring if you came here and just got stuff all the time. You need to get out there like the Apostle Paul. You need to get out there like many people through history. You need to get out there and put your stuff into exercise, into action. That's what you need to do. At some stage, you're going to be able to pray for someone. And when you pray for somebody, something might happen. Something might happen. And my desire for you is that you will know who you are and you will deal with it. When I'm praying for somebody, I'm going to start praying for people soon, but when I'm praying for somebody, uh, and I'll just put this into, into, into perspective. Okay, 
So I'm not, I am not a professional minister. I'm not a pastor. I don't work full time at a church. I'm a tradie. I've got my own small business on the Gold Coast. Before I came here to, to uh, Breakthrough, I was working 14 hour days just to get through the job so I could be here with you. All right? I wasn't praying 14 hours a day to come here. I was praying in the car when I was driving an hour and a half up to Brisbane and an hour and a half back. I was thinking about you. I was looking at you in the spirit realm and I was, I was, I was watching for you. So I was asking God as I was going up, right, you need to show me stuff. I haven't got five hours in a day. I get, I get up at three o'clock in the morning. I'm home at six o'clock at night. I've got three kids. Two of them are teenagers. Same age as you guys. You already know how much of a handful you are. You wait till you become a parent. <laughs> and a bad parent. I'm bad. I'm bad. Oh, when we had our first baby, when we had our first baby, we took him home, put him in the bed in the little cot next to our bed so he could be close. He was a big fella. He's still a big fella. Every little snuffle and chuffle and cough and sneeze and whatever in the night. The lights had come on and me and Marissa, my wife, would get up. Oh, he's choking. Something's happening. But he was just doing his little snuffle chuffle. You know? So this is the first baby. Dog, dog, quick, get something. Ring the doctor. He coughed. I don't know how many trips the emergency center. Let's take him to the back. You know what I mean? By the third baby. She was choking. And, and I was just like, oh, go back to sleep, blasted kids. <laughs> That's terrible. Anyway, it hasn't got better. Anyway, so all I'm saying to you is this, is that, is, that, is that we need to know who we are. We need to know who we are and what we're about. Action is coming. Even if you put your hand up and say, I want to follow Jesus, action is coming your way. As soon as you say, God, come into my life, I want to be a party, it's going to be great. He's going to minister to you. He's going to do all that stuff. He's going to do all that stuff. But then a day will come for you to go out and do action. And I want to be confident, and I am 100% confident in you guys. You are quality people. You are quality people. Unfortunately, someone else has told you different, and you believed it, and you feel like you've got nothing to offer. I'm telling you tonight, this morning, God wants you to have full confidence in who you are. When I pray for someone, I walked up to someone one day in a meeting. This is me, tradie, right? I, I love wearing jandals and shorts. That's me. Walked up to the person, and they just started manifesting, because the Holy Spirit was there, started manifesting straight away. They started manifesting straight away. And she was, she was going like this. She was going like this. I was walking up to her, looking at her, oh, g'day, and she's like, thick, And I was like, oh, hello. Who we got here? <laughs> and so, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't joke about these things, you know, at the time because I'm under the authority of the pastor of the church or wherever I am and, and you know, the Holy Spirit. My, my whole life is under God's authority. I've got nothing. I've got no tricks for you. I've got no tricks, nothing. I tried that once and I, and I got strangled by demons. You, know, you have to do it once you learn. Oh, mate, these fellas in here in the, in the story, you only need to be beaten and stripped naked and run out in public once to know just I won't do that again. Okay? But I came up to her and I was like, okay, let, let's pray for you. And she wouldn't look at me. And she'd just look away, look away, look away. It was like, because look into my eyes so I can see what's going on, man. So she looks over and she goes, I don't want to. And I'm just like, oh, the man voice. The man voice. And straight away, I'm like, I could just go somewhere real funny with this, but this, this lady actually needs to be set free from this. So she, the demon wasn't letting her look at me because as soon as it looked at me, I knew it would just show itself. So in the name of Jesus, not that Paul preaches, in the name of Jesus, who I know, who I'm secure in, who I know who I am in, come out. And this is for you this morning. Some of you here this morning going, oh, I could never do that. Yes, you flipping could. I'm telling you right now. Yes, you could. And I have 100% confidence in you to do it. Guys, get the, um, 
I've got an invisible band behind me. Here they are. <laughs> here they are, right here. And, uh, hey, guys, I just want you to give Warwick a hand. This guy's a legend. Come on. This is Beck. Beck's been leading the praise and worship. She's a, she's a legend as well. The whole team here get up early in the morning to come and lead us into a place of worship. Lead us into a place of worship. We're going to just sing a song. Can we sing that um, hallelujah in the worship presence, enemies? We're going to sing the song together. And what's going to happen is this. I, I, just, I just want you to, to do this. As we're singing the song, I want you to let it out. Let it out. Wairua, spirit, let it out. Because when you let out the wairua, then the wairua tapu, the Holy Spirit, comes and connects. And I know that when the Holy Spirit comes and connects, there's going to be some stuff go down. I don't care where you're sitting in this building. I don't care what your state is in life. God wants to move on you this morning. And what we're going to do is as we're singing the song, I'm going to, we'll take a bit of time. I'm going to call you up. I want you to come up. I want you to let God come and begin to show you who he is. I want to get some of the pastors. We're going to lay hands on you and we're going to pray for you. So that means if you're a youth pastor in here or, or the pastors that are here, you need to be up the front when people come. You need to be ready to pray. And what we're going to be praying is for God to reveal himself and reveal who they are and begin to pour out his spirit into them, into the youth that come up here. Begin to show them their identity. Begin to show them things. And youth pastors and pastors that are here, some of, these, some of the youth that are here may have issues that come up when the Holy Spirit talks to them. Deal with it in the name of Jesus. I have full confidence in you to deal with it in the name of Jesus. Not in the name of Jesus that Pastor Bev spoke. Not in the name of Jesus that Pastor Ryan and Pastor Emma were talking about. But in the name of Jesus who you know. Isn't that awesome? Let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing this song. Thanks, Bev.